Good evening, everyone. My name is Dean Saranilio. I teach here in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, I'm very honored to be able to introduce tonight's panel, uh, which are conversations highlighting the work of the Polynesian Voyaging Society and their aims with the Hokulea's arrival here on June 5th. And to also ask the question, what happens to Manhattan when we remember Manhattan? To sort of work against the historical amnesia and the quote unquote urban nullius of cities that often presume native issues to have no relevant to current issues. <laughs> so today's events are a collaboration between the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU and the Global Studies, Environmental Studies, and Urban Studies programs at the New School. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the Asian Pacific American Studies program here in SEA, the NYU Native American and Indigenous Students Group, Halavai, uh, and Not Uivi, New York City. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to Jas Dillon. Where is Jas? Hi, Hi Jas. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to work with you, and I hope we can continue to collaborate on building Native Studies programs here. Um, <clears throat> Amita Mangnani, who is also from Hawaii, uh, the events coordinator at the APA Institute, whose creativity and amazing organizing skills makes events at the APA Institute relevant, interesting, and always timely. Uh, and Beatrice Glow and Jack Chen for hosting this morning's talk story breakfast at the APA Institute gallery space, uh, where the current wayfinding project uh, is on view until December. So I often wonder what the Hawaiian voyage in canoe Hokulea might do to different New Yorkers' conceptions of possibilities when the crew arrives in New York City, Lenape territory on June 5th, this summer. And so through the ancestral art of wayfinding, those courageously navigating and sailing the Hokulea are able to brush aside colonial tropes that infantilize native peoples as a quote unquote wasteland of non-achievement. Navigators on the Hokulea use no instruments, rather they rely on knowledge taught by Sarawali's Grandmaster Navigator Maupiailuk. If any of you are interested in learning more about Papa Maupiailuk, uh, Na'alehu Anthony did a beautiful documentary of him. Um, and so this knowledge uh, taught by Papa Maupiailuk is coupled with an ongoing Hawaiian creative practice that reads the sun, moon, stars, clouds, winds, waves, and the patterns of a diversity of non-human species to find their way. <clears throat> the canoe's worldwide voyage is called Mala Mahunua to care for our earth and is expected to cover 47,000 nautical miles, 85 ports, and 26 countries in order to, as a Polynesian voyaging society uh, describes it, quote, engage all of island earth, practicing how to live sustainably while sharing, learning, creating global relationships, and discovering the wonders of this precious place we call home. In this way, the Voyage and Canoe aims to strengthen a global movement for the resurgence of indigenous knowledges, language, languages, and land-based practices that are ever needed in the production of alternative futures. In a moment defined by, yet largely apathetic, to anthropogenic climate change, what mana, what form of power might we witness when the Voyage and Canoe arrives into New York City with the possibility of flipping colonial modernity on its head and creating space for native subjugated knowledges to chart New Epistings for the 21st century, at least that's what I hope the Hokulea will do. <laughs> and so as we reach a critical point in this planet's history, global systems of US empire, militarism, and capitalism reveal themselves as accountable to abstract notions of profit and power, yet increasingly materialize in their capacity to destroy the resources and res relations sustaining various forms of life. Despite Manhattan and Hawaii being popularly imagined as oppositional landscapes, iconically the intensely urban versus the remotely tropical, a long historical view of Manhattan reveals that the island was once, was once rich with incredible biodiversity, with more than 55 different ecological communities, a biodiversity per acre that has been described as rivaling <laughs> US national parks, and I should make a mention that national parks are themselves native land seized by the federal government. Sure. <clears throat> Manhattan was once home to bears, wolves, songbirds, and salamanders, and the rivers surrounding the island an estuary productive of brackish water where the salt and fresh water meat in Hawaii, so called the mulivai, was filled with whales and porpoises. So if one looks at the inaugural forms of violence in the creation of Wall Street, currently a kind of central nervous system for global capitalism, 
One discovers that it was an actual apartheid wall meant to keep the Lenape and British away from Dutch settlements. And with the numerous remo removals that according to Hadrian Cummins were stalled for nearly 150 years through the diplomacy of the Lenape with the Dutch, the Lenape now reside in numerous places including New Jersey, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. So it's not hard to see how such removals caused the landscape of Manahata to change. And Hawaii, one of the most biologically diverse areas on the planet, shares commonalities with Manahata. Hawaii is often touted as a quote unquote endangered species capital of the world, with more endangered species per square mile than any other place on the planet. As ecofeminist Vandana Shiva writes, quote, economic growth hides the poverty it creates through the destruction of nature, which in turn leads to communities lacking the capacity to provide for themselves. Furthermore, in talking with Hadrian Cummins, a co-founder and director of the Lenape Center, also from this afternoon's session, seeking to reestablish a Lenape presence in New York City, Hawaii and Lenape Hoking were both seized through fraud and the theatricality of the settler state. For the Lenape, contrary to imperial myth, uh, there exists no deed of sale for Manhattan, just as there exists no treaty of annexation for Hawaii. And so I'm gonna skip because I feel like I'm talking for too long. Uh, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just this fall, there were the kind of quote unquote unthinkable and unprecedented three category four hurricanes swirling simultaneously in the Pacific. Not unlike Hurricane Sandy here in 2014, it is ironic that the size and strength of extreme weather patterns continue to be described as unthinkable and unprecedented at the same time that moves for indigenous resurgence around land-based economies to counter climate crisis are also disqualified as unthinkable and unprecedented. Famed navigator Nainoa Thompson of the Hokulea says about their worldwide voyage, quote, we're not going to change the world, but we're going to go and build a network of people around the earth who are going to change it. And our job is to help them be successful. And so hopefully in line with this statement, we have convened today's events to ask us to consider the very land beneath our feet, to think about the material consequences of allowing the settler state to go unchecked. So our first speaker for this evening is Na'alehu Anthony, who is native Hawaiian from Ka'awa, Oahu, and the founder of Paliku Documentary Films, a production company that focuses on documentaries and oral histories uh, with a special emphasis on Hawaii and its people. Na'alehu's other great passion is being a part of the voyaging community. As a crew member since 1995, and more recently as a captain aboard the Hokulea, his voyaging experiences have shaped and defined him as a person and has been a focal point for his films. He is the lead storyteller for the three-year worldwide voyage, working with a team of producers and photographers to provide daily material from the canoe to the rest of the world. Anthony is also the CEO for OEV Television Network, found on Oceanic Cable's digital uh, channel 326 and at OEV TV. You can watch all of the, those programming on OEV TV on, uh, on the web. Uh, so OEV TV is the first and only Hawaiian-owned and operated television network. This was also a project motivated by his desire to provide a dissemination venue for quality Hawaiian content. And therefore, OEV TV is the only all Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian language content station in Hawaii. So Na'alehu's upbringing, education, and experience led him to pursue his most recent role in the community as vice chairman and Oahu commissioner for the Native Hawaiian Role Commission. Our next speaker <coughs> is Kehalani Kaunui, uh, who speaks so often here in NYU and New York City, I feel like she doesn't really need an introduction. <laughs> I told Audra Simpson before, you should just get her an office. I feel like we should do the same with you. Uh, so Kehalani is an associate professor of American studies and anthropology at Wesleyan University, where she teaches comparative colonialism, indigenous studies, critical race studies, and anarchist studies. Kawanui's first book is the seminal text, Hawaiian Blood, Colonialism, and the Politics of Sovereignty and Indigeneity. Her second book currently in progress is titled The Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty, which is a critical study on land, gender, and sexual politics, and the tensions regarding indigeneity in relation to status Hawaiian nationalism. Kaunui serves as a radio producer for an anarchist politics show called Anarchy on Air. She previously hosted the radio show Indigenous Politics, which aired for seven years and was broadly syndicated. She is an original co-founder of the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, which I believe is largely responsible for the enormous growth of Native Studies scholarship in the past decade. Kaunui is currently a National Council member of the American Studies Association and also serves on the advisory board of the very important U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Last but not least is Stephen Newcomb. Uh, he's Shawnee Lenape 
<coughs> a legal scholar and advocate for original nations. In 1992, he and Virgil Kilstreet, a traditional headman of the elder of the Oglala Lakota Nation, founded the Indigenous Law Institute and began challenging globally imperial Vatican documents from the 15th century. Those documents resulted in the decimation and domination of the original nations and peoples of Mother Earth, and thereby deprived the planet of lifeways, sustainable ecosystems, and sacred teachings. Newcomb's book, which is widely cited, is called Pagans in the Promised Land, Decoding the Doctrine of Christian Discoveries, published in 2008. Uh, he also has a documentary uh, titled The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking <coughs> the Domination Code. Um, Newcomb has published hundreds of essays and several law review articles and a chapter for the Whitey Blackwell Companion to Religion and Politics in the U.S., edited by Barbara A. McGraw. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Thank you. Dean, he said my whole presentation already, so I gotta make up a new one, but. No, Laila. Mala nui a o ko pakahi a pau no ke a hui ana no ke a vala ana no ka papa hana o ka mala mahonua a hua kai worldwide voyage o va o na alehu Anthony no ka awa mai au ma kamu kapuni o ahu i ka va ka hiko loa aya ko ko ka ohana o ko ma 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 Hana ma Maui. Mahalo nui a Dean, a Mita, no ke a Awamu Kuleana o ke a Halawai. Mahalo nui. A me a ke a Mapoe ma New Yorker no ke a Valaau. All I said was, my name is Naalehu and I'm from a small town of Kaaava on Oahu. I want to thank everyone who came out tonight and uh, was interested in the voyage and hopefully interested in, in kind of this discussion of resurgence because it's an important one. Uh, before I go too far, I do want to acknowledge my older brother in the crowd tonight, my brother Kalai, who uh, lives in the city and came out and, and wanted to support the, the conversation tonight as well. And it's always good to see him. So thank you for coming. Um, the idea of this resurgence is an, is an interesting one. The conversation earlier today was really fruitful for those of you who got to come. And, and I think what's so important about it is that uh, we're just this sliver in time of this arc of resurgence. And so I actually, I, I left like right at three o'clock when we were in Q&A in the, in the previous one because I went and re-racked everything based on, on that, that idea because the conversation this, this afternoon was so fruitful in the idea of what it means and how you express it and the, the vehicles and the vessels that you use to, to be able to do that. And so the, the first person I wanted to, to show everyone tonight was my grandmother. And I don't usually bring her into the, into the canoe space, um, but I think it's important to do so with respect to this idea of resurgence because there were all these kupuna that people talked about today. And we're gonna see a few more of them in a little bit, but all these kupuna these, these elders, these, those who came before us, who held that resurgence and pushed on it and wanted it to move forward. And for our ohana, she certainly did that. She, um, she wasn't someone who had uh, the kind of education that a lot of us enjoy. She actually left school very early on in life to work, but she insisted upon it for all of us. And that for our family, she changed the tangent of it in a generation so that my mother could be the first ever in her family to graduate high school, uh, let alone to go to college. And that shifted everything. And you see families time and time again that do that. And that's one of the most important things that you can do in this whole thing. We get caught up in the bigger picture of all these things, but within our ohana, I think it's really important to be able to articulate that and say, hey, you know, we expect you to not only be uh, proficient in all of these things that our ancestors did, but you also got to compete in these other ways as well. And I, that's what I saw today. And, and so I wanted you to see her because she only passed away a couple of years ago, but um, she worked till she was 85 and had a work ethic that I try to hold up 
every day because of uh, her perspective on that importance of making it better. And then I had to go and yank this slide because <clears throat> because of the, the, the previous conversation about canoes. It's amazing what happens when some other person or people or culture or viewplane take your voice. That's really what this discussion is about. We're talking about resurgence. For what I do in, in all of the things that I, I work on, whether it's the voyage, it's, it's about a positive reflection of our people for our people, but it's also taking back the voice. And so up into the 60s and 70s, you saw the modern anthropological view of what and where Polynesians came from uh, voiced by someone else. And this is a really, really fortunate thing to have happened because this vessel here, which is, by the way, not the Voyaging Canoe Hokulea, this is the Kontiki, <laughs> the other canoe. Um, if it wasn't for those who said, hey, they must have drifted uh, accidentally from South America because of the prevailing trade winds, if it wasn't for any of this, then those who built Hokulea would not have been uh, so invigorated to do so, right? These were these armchair uh, our academics who sat there and said, ah, well, you know, maybe they did this, maybe they did that, the pita pottery, oh, maybe the, you know, the, the, the way of migration is told through language, we're not sure. Or maybe they went and found a sweet potato and then they drifted into uh, the Pacific. <clears throat> but without this vessel and 50 million copies of a book and uh, Thor being far more famous than, than Ben Finney, uh, you would not have what you have today, uh, the Voyage Inkuru Hokulea. And so, on her maiden voyage, um, there were a number of reasons why Hokulea was, would sail from Hawaii to Tahiti uh, unaided by any modern navigational equipment. No maps, no compass, no sextant, GPS didn't exist, none of that stuff. Um, it was to recraft the narrative, it was to take back some of that voice. Um, it was also, I think, for a lot of the people who were on board who were Native Hawaiian, who wanted to reclaim that cultural identity. But I don't think anyone knew what it would do. I think there were hopes and there were wishes, but I don't think anyone could have thought that 40 years later we'd be sailing around the planet. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The idea of reproving these ancestral pathways uh, were incomplete. Hokula is a fiberglass hulled vessel. She's what's, call, what's called a um, modern performance accurate replica of what you would have seen probably 600 years ago. And what that means is that uh, she sails at about the point that a canoe could have sailed into the wind given 600 years ago, and she goes at about the speed. So you're setting the conditions to be able to travel in a certain direction for a certain amount of time um, to see whether or not you could make these large crossings uh, as they would have done maybe 600 years ago. But the part that was missing, um, and the most important part, and the part that has probably fueled more of the canoe journey than anything else was the navigator. This is Po Navigator Maupiailu. He was one of the youngest uh, of the, the Po Navigators of his time, and also one of the most fierce. If you think about it, right, in Micronesia, you would see these um, these inner island hops of three and four hundred miles and really if you look through Micronesia you can see all of these different places where you can go from one island to the next spanning no more than 400 miles and what they came and asked them to do was sail 2,500 miles to a place he'd never been to to a hemisphere he'd never gone to and he said yes Now, there are those who talk to him, and there are probably personal reasons, and there are these obvious reasons why he would have said yes. But one of those is also because of how navigators are viewed um, in the traditional setting. They're getters of resource. And, and that amount of resource that you can get is predicated on how far you can go. And that's really the definition of that kind of resource in, in that kind of setting. It's not money that you have in the bank. It's where can you go to bring resource home to your people. But part of that resource is also that reflection of whether or not that resource is worth it. And he saw it on the decline. And he saw it on the decline because you have the compass and the sextant and the GPS and these instruments that, right, this device 
can co-op 3,000 years of knowledge by finding this building, pressing a button, looking for the pathway. But what he also knew was that this was big enough that if he broke tradition and took this knowledge somewhere else, that it might just reverberate through the earth and change the axis of it just a little bit for some people. And that it did. When you look at the arrival in Tahiti, so that's all water all around everyone, right? And 17,000 people came to Tahiti at this arrival. This is the first time that a voyaging canoe had come from Hawaii in, in, in modern times. And it, it, it did a bunch of fundamental things. I mean, obviously it inspired uh, more than just Hawaiians. And, it, and it, it certainly reunited the nation of Polynesia because everybody was watching. But it also took back the voice. It took back the voice, and that voice was now crafted by those who sailed this canoe, by those who got back in the driver's seat to say, yes, we're the ones of authority, and we will make change in these communities uh, with these vessels, because all of the stuff that you taught us about being off course and drifting as fishermen and how the Pacific was populated was a lie. And that the truth is that this was all purposeful and they did it by these brilliant, brilliant people a thousand years before anyone would even attempt to leave sight of land in Europe. But it did something else that's really important. It changed the way in which we view these pathways, this water. When we put up the map of the Pacific, the first thing you see are these tiny little islands and all this water. And the water is seen as a barrier in Western thought. But now that the voyaging canoe reconnects these places, for Polynesians, it became a way at which we could actually travel and find a path. <clears throat> and so the path forward was one of robust disruption. The disruption that came from the canoe just making a 2,500 mile journey to Tahiti would reverberate through every other facet of what it is that we do. Our Hawaiian language had been banned for more than 100 years. We were down to the last 200 native speakers, and out of the 70s came the revitalization movement to want to bring back our language, because core to our culture is language. That idea that you can bring language into a place that is foreign to make it yours is, is key to engaging that audience on your own terms. And so this is the concert that they hold every year, and these are all kids, K-12, and they're churning hundreds of them out, not enough I would, I would argue, but, but hundreds of them to take back that voice in our Olelo. The idea of protest became one that was very, very popular. Um, this is a slide from the recent Mauna Kea movement that we covered uh, as part of OEV TV. This movement used every tool that it had at its uh, fingertips to be able to change the articulation of message. What's so important about this slide, not only, the people have been protesting for centuries, right? We're still, today, we're protesting in the room, right? Talking about uh, the, different, the different topics that are hot topics here all the way out of the East Coast. But not only did they take back the narrative, they used these tools to inspire and connect others that were unconnected before through mainstream media. And that's actually how uh, they won, was because they had these tools that they could articulate in a way that allowed them to disrupt mainstream media and own the narrative. And then of course what we're doing at OEV TV. For me, you know, I grew up on the picket line. From five years old, I stopped 7-Eleven, boycott something, some eviction, uh, we boycotted the governor. We, I mean, we've, we've been protesting this whole time. But to me, I remember sitting, standing there with these signs, you know, honk for Hawaiians, but like, okay, honk for what? Why? We don't have a voice, right? And, and part of that is, is the idea that you have something to stand on and something important to say and something articulate enough to say so that other people can hear you. And so in storytelling, if you're really eloquent at it, it's not so much whether or not you have a certain position, although you should. Even when you're unbiased, there's bias. 
but it's making sure that you're eloquent enough so that people lower their expectation of what they thought you were going to say and you actually can engage them at a level that allows them to let their guard down and just think about it for a second. That's one. The other is that the positive reflection that we cast at OEV TV is critical, right? Because mainstream media comes at us every day, right? Saying we're not good enough, we're the wrong size, we're the wrong color, we're the wrong shape. The Hawaiians in news, in mainstream news, they killed somebody, they raped somebody, they did something bad, and that reflection that is cast shapes us, right? Media, it decides what we wear, what we drive, how we act, what watch I have on, right? It's such a powerful tool, and yet we've been denying it all these years rather than using it as a positive tool to reflect back. And so that's why we started with OEV TV. I think that one of the most important things that we did, that we talked about, we talked about a little bit, was uh, being able to cover the voyage. So I'm a crew member, I've been a crew member as long as I've been a photographer, but we built up this stable of photographers that could help cover the voyage so that we had the ability to have a photographer on every day, day in and day out, to document what's going on and tell these stories. And so, when we look out into the horizon, there's this really interesting thing that happens, right? It's such a powerful, powerful thing. For those of us who've been sailing on canoes, it's a powerful, powerful thing. But there's only 13 people on board. Right? The canoe deck is only as big as this half. Right down the line, right there. That's the canoe deck. Okay, and 13 people get to go on a month voyage. And so those 13 people are so heavily impacted. But what about everybody else? What about the, the families of those crew members who support them, the communities, the nation, the world? that could care about what values we're carrying with us on the canoe. And so that's the perspective in which we engage the voyage and why it is we thought it was so important to do that. Uh, the other perspective that I think is really important, and back at home I, I rarely use this olelo noyao because it's kind of overused and simplistic. Uh, heva'a he moku, he moku heva'a. Uh, the canoe is an island, the island is a canoe. Okay. On our particular island that we're sailing in Florida right now, that we're going to be here in a few months, that island is precious. If you don't take care of it, if you don't malama it, she cannot malama you. And that scale and scope of that perspective goes all the way out to this island, Earth, floating in this sea of space. And we talked about that today. And so for us, the perspective is really one that is necessary to be able to then say, well, what if it's not just Hawaii? We know it's bigger than Hawaii. What if it's not just Polynesia? What if it's not just the Pacific of which we've sailed all around? But what if some of those perspectives were common to people all around the planet? And then it's just a, it's just a matter of being able to take that and share with people these stories of hope and share with other people how this interaction is something that allows for a larger discussion about how we can work together, about how we're more common than we are different. And so that's really the premise for the voyage. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna haphazardly toggle through the other presentation real quick just to get you the video so that um, we can show you, is it the next one? The other one. One more? Oh, there's the video. We'll play this short video, and then I'll just finish up, and then we can take questions at the, at the end end. But um, yeah, this, I think, is the, one of the better articulations of why. And if you've seen it before, I'm sorry. <laughs> you just got to bear with. Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China, and came out of Taiwan. Then you get the Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii, 
in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. 10 million square miles, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. They were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the Earth. Unaided by modern instruments, these extraordinary explorers discovered and settled every livable landmass in the Pacific, relying solely on a complex understanding of the stars, the winds, the waves, and other cues from nature. Guided by this traditional wisdom and perspective, Hawaiians mastered the science of living sustainably on islands. Western expansion, however, brought not only new ways of seafaring, but a shift in perspective on how to interact with the natural environment. Eventually, traditional practices and worldviews were nearly forgotten. But a group of determined individuals got together in the 1970s to resurrect indigenous wisdom by building a traditional canoe and sailing it in the way of the ancestors. Hokulea's first voyage to Tahiti reawakened a cultural pride, identity, and an intimate connection to place. In a generation, Hokulea has sailed over 140,000 nautical miles to reunite the world's largest oceanic nation. Today, Hokulea voyages around the planet with a message of malama honua, or caring for island earth, with a firm belief that blending traditional and modern technologies will help us find our way to a healthier future. Hokulea, to us, to go around the world, has this enormous potential to go to 40, 50 countries on the planet, to be with the great navigators on Earth. And I'm not talking about those in canoes. I'm talking about those who are doing things to give kindness and compassion to the Earth and those who live on it, those navigators. We're not gonna change the world, but we're gonna go and build a network of people around the Earth who are gonna change it. And our job is to help them be successful. You can also uh, donate at hokulea.com to the voyage. <laughs> uh, so just to finish up, you know, we have these amazing experiences to engage and, and inspire via this voyage. Uh, this is a photo that we took almost a year ago in New Zealand at Manaya Kalani School. And what you see here are several hundred of the uh, 2,500 kids that came to greet the canoes. And what that tells me is that the ability for these canoes to inspire is reverberating through the Pacific and, and hopefully the world. When we sail to these different places, we're causing disruption. When we come to New York, it's those images of that contrast, of that disruption, that I think will be the most phenomenal. This idea that we were in Sydney um, at the Opera House, we, as, a, as the photography team, we try to consistently place our photographers in, in these, uh, these situations where we can take photos that are iconic. So when you take one look at this, you know where it is. And I think that the New York skyline or the Statue of Liberty of the United Nations is, is, uh, is gonna be very similar to that. And what that does for us is it's a, it's a reminder of the kind of explorationism and the kind of adventurism that uh, our kupuna had more than a thousand years ago um, that are still in, that's still inside of us, all of us, and that uh, that idea of exploration means that we can really look uh, to those teachings of the ancestors. If you want to cause change, if you want to cause disruption, if you want to cause uh, resurgence, uh, you can look at uh, what they do on the canoe. They're uh, practicing it every day. So some people say like the navigator makes 6,000 decisions a day. 
okay, what direction, what speed, where we're going, how fast, uh, how many miles, uh, open the sail, close the sail, you know, is the crew member sick, do they need to be on watch, all of these things. And those 6,000 decisions that they make every day cause change, positive change in the right direction. And that's a good lesson for all of us, that if you want to cause change and disruption and start to change the arc of where everything's going, you can do so one day at a time, one decision at a time. So, no laila, mahalo nui a oko pakahi apau. And uh, please come see us June 5th when we come with the canoes. Uh, it'll be a good time and uh, tell all your friends and you know, hopefully many thousand will come and this, this will be, we've, I personally thought before the voyage started that New York would be the pinnacle of the voyage with the exception of the canoes going home and I still believe that and uh, please come help us make that a success. So thank you very much. Wow. You, got, you got to go see Leslie for where, she's in charge. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Mahalo. Aloha kako, Valina kako. Greetings, everyone. It's really good to be here. Aloha. This place is packed. Wow. I um, want to acknowledge uh, the Napi territory and the Napi people, the sovereignty of this territory, the endurance of the Lenape people. And when I say sovereignty, I don't mean that in the Western Westphalian sense. I mean that in terms of the eternalness of indigeneity. It was really good to be at the earlier panel today, um, and I so appreciate the work that was presented. It was really compelling and beautiful and moving. I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Dean Serenilio for inviting me, also to the co-organizer for this morning. Thank you so much. And Amita Magnani, thank you for having me, all the logistical support. I, um, just as a personal note, I am a daughter of the diaspora. I'm an unapologetic California-born Hawaiian. I'm Kanaka Maui on my father's side, hence my surname. I have a white American mother from Pittsburgh, who's Irish and German, who supports the work I do. And my father supports the work that I do as well. I um, want to acknowledge my ohana. My dad's from Anahola Homelands territory on the island of Kauai. And both his parents, my grandparents were Kanaka Maoli. My grandfather was from Kaunakakai, Molokai. My grandmother was raised on Kauai, but her family lines come through. Wailuku Maui is sort of the most uh, nearest kin. I, uh, I want to acknowledge before I, I go into my presentation, I just, I've presented in this room before, but I never actually looked up until this today what Cooper Square and Cooper Union is. And I thought, wow, you know, the kind of flip side around indigenous resurgence and learning about Peter Cooper as an American industrialist, inventor, someone who promoted science and the arts, the kind of quintessential philanthropist. Uh, he ran for American president, I learned. And also uh, the sort of quintessential colonial figure in my mind, who was the inventor of the locomotive, um, the steam locomotive, so I think about colonialism and destruction and the railways, and just thinking about this site that we're at in this particular part of Manhattan. I also just want to um, say a bit of a personal story. I want to really just acknowledge the people from the Polynesian Voyaging Society. I'm just in awe of the work that you do. I had the pleasure of um, greeting the Hokulea in Long Beach, California in the summer of 1995 with my father. He was living in Southern California at the time. He'd been there since the mid-60s, and it was phenomenal. Um, my dad's cousin was one of the, the hula masters whose halau helped greet the hokulea at the time, and also the Tonga and Chumash peoples, indigenous to the area, welcomed the boat, and I had just come back to California after a year and a half of living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, doing comparative work on Maori and Hawaiian sovereignty struggles in fighting state unilateral settlements. And, um, my dad now lives in Fort Myers, Florida, and when he found out that the Hokulea was hitting the coast of Florida, he texted me, is coming. I gotta go find a Hawaiian flag. I can, I can hear his voice in my head. And I'm like, okay, but are the Seminole people gonna be there? Or is the Seminole tribe gonna be there? He says, I'll let you know. 
so he went to Everglades City, and he went to Fort Myers, where he lives, and he was so excited. He emailed me photos. He had uh, sent me a photo of a picture of him wearing his purple shirt representing Kauai, right, purple. And he has a picture with Seminole tribal elder um, Bobby Henry. And I asked my dad, I said, what was it like to see it? Because I wanted to hear what he had to say. And he said it was like I'm coming home to my roots. So I just want to acknowledge that. In terms of indigenous resurgence, the first time I've heard the concept, I mean, I'm familiar with the, con the work that's been going on in Hawaii for a very long time, but in terms of that terminology, I think of the work of Taiage Alfred, who's Ganawagi Mohawk, and I want to read a quote from him that for me is sort of a point of entry to what I want to discuss today, which has to do with competing Hawaiian sovereignty projects between federal recognition and the quest for Hawaiian independence and sort of my own critical perspective on the limits of both of these models. And then looking at the role of settler colonialism in erasing indigenous lifeways in Hawaii and the role of decoloniality and indigenous resurgence. This quote, in this quote, Taiwe Alfred is speaking specifically to the Canadian state context, but I think it's apt and it also resonates with some of the discussion that came out in the Q&A earlier today around the concept of reconciliation. Somehow, this um, slide a little bit. Thank you. I'm afraid if I try it, it'll, I'll knock it over. Quote, a facade of reconciliation, and he uses the scare quotes. A facade of reconciliation is being used to buttress white supremacy, pacify and co-opt indigenous leadership, and facilitate total access to indigenous lands for resource development. Against this, an ancestral mo movement has re-emerged among some indigenous thinkers and indigenous and settler ally activists in North America. Indigenous resurgence. These people are dedicated to recasting indigenous people in terms that are authentic and meaningful to regenerating and organizing a radical political consciousness, to reoccupying land and gaining restitution to protecting the natural environment and to restoring the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between indigenous nations and settlers. This reframing of indigeneity as resurgence promotes the kind of action and provides the spiritual and ethical basis, bases for a transformative movement that has the potential to liberate both indigenous peoples and settlers from colonialism." End quote. Now, mind you, when he says a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, he's not talking about a nation within a nation, right, which is US federal policy on tribal nations. He's talking about face-to-face -face embodied sovereignty of people on equal grounds, what I consider a mutually consensual relationship, not the abusive relationship that indigenous peoples find themselves in with oppressive state, states who dominate. For me, what's so critical about this quote and the work that, that Tayagi Alfred and others have been doing for so long is ripping off the mask of the politics of federal recognition. And this is what I've been tracking in the Hawaiian context. I mean, I've been tracking the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and been affiliated with it since November 1990, but from a critical edge and also appropriate to my own social position as a member of the diaspora with strong uh, family ties and movement ties. But what we see in terms of the federal recognition piece in Hawaii, and this is for me important thinking about my social location here. I live in Middletown, Connecticut, in the traditional territory of the Wangunk people. And I've witnessed in New England since I moved there in 2000, the way that the state of Connecticut, state officials have actually intervened in the federal recognition process. In really, in really horrendous ways that are detrimental to tribes throughout the country, not just in Connecticut, but especially those in New England and three tribes in particular in Connecticut, the Shkatakoke, the Golden Hill Pagasset, and the Eastern Pequot. And so I'm very sensitive to the politics of federal recognition and tribes that want it, and that it comes, it's initiated from the people themselves. In Hawaii, it's quite different. You know, we had Hawaiians fighting for federal recognition in the 80s, and at that time, Hawaii state officials and federal government officials said, no way. And then you have a sort of a shift in turn around Hawaiian politics 
and you know, by the mid-90s, you have the, the 50th state officials. I have to be careful when I say Hawaii state. There's the independent state of Hawaii and there's the 50th state. 50th state officials began driving a federally initiated um, mandate for federal recognition. So very different than what you see in New England where the, the indigenous peoples wanted it. There are other native peoples who are critical of that. But what I'm trying to uh, d say about myself is that as somebody standing in solidarity with people who want that, I'm not necessarily criticizing their desire to have it, even though I'm very critical of the federal uh, containment of indigenous people sovereignty, especially within that model. But in the Hawaiian case, it really is, I see it as very federally driven and state officials driven. That doesn't mean that there aren't Kanaka Maoli wanting it, right? So that's not what I'm saying. I, I think a vast majority of people on island may want it. I think it remains to be seen because we don't actually have any data collected. People do polls. And for me, we can say that the majority of people might want it, but for me, the question is in the framing of what would be forfeited for people who actually articulate a signing on to that political project. So, for example, in my own family, a lot of people say, well, we, we have to have that or we're gonna lose our leases to Hawaiian homelands. So in that sense, I identify it as coercive. It's out of fear. They feel like they're not gonna be able to live in Hawaiian homelands. Or they say, we have to have this as a first step to independence. It's like, actually it doesn't work that way, <laughs> you know? Once you dem have demonstrated acquiescence, then you have a forfeiture under international law. And there's no evidence of Hawaiian acquiescence to U.S. sovereign authority that exists at this time, none. We stand on the Ku'e petitions of our kupuna, our elders, who signed a massive petition, two massive petitions that Noi Noi Silva helped unearth that said in both Hawaiian and English language, we do not wish to be part of the US government in any shape or form. So it wasn't ambiguous, very, very clear articulation there. So I'm very critical of federal recognition as a state-driven project, but I'm also critical of some of the activism that has been moving to restore Hawaiian sovereignty, what I would say kingdom nationalists. And what's happened is you have a rejection. This is how I'm seeing it in terms of what I've been analyzing. You have kingdom nationalists who are committed to Hawaiian independence, who want the US to de-occupy. It's a discourse of de-occupation. And what they've done in terms of pushing back on federal recognition, whether it was the Akaka bill that went through congressional channels and failed for 12 years, or now the sort of end run that the Department of the Interior is opening up a space for this to happen at the executive branch because it failed at the legislative branch. And this to me is so intense, you know. You know, the federal government comes knocking on Hawaiian's doors. We're gonna create a special rule just for you because you're so special. And we're gonna, for, you know, we're gonna not, you know, we're gonna reject tribes from getting federal recognition because they don't meet the criteria, but we're gonna create a whole new set of criteria just for you. And it's like, when the government comes knocking on your door saying that they've got a special something for you, and it's the USA, you know, duck for cover. So what, I, what I'm talking about are the two prongs of status nationalism. Whether it's nation within a nation or whether it's restoring Hawaiian kingdom, what's missing a lot of times from this discourse is the role of settler colonialism. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Hawaiian independence movement, this has kind of twisted and morphed into really alarming um, anti-indigenous rhetoric. So you'll have people say, well, we're not a tribe, we're a kingdom. Uh, and they'll imply a sort of a uh, chauvinism. We're more modern, we're more advanced, we're more civilized. And taking up sort of notions of Western modernity to try and distance Kanaka Maoli from other indigenous peoples in a way that I find really horrendous and taking part in forms of anti-indigenous racism. And so, you know, I'm very critical of that work and thinking, you know, the issue is not that indigenous peoples didn't create states like the Hawaiian elites did in the early to mid 19th century. The problem is that international law, which is built on Christian domination and purports to be secular, gives states more power over peoples. And you know, I draw here on Stephen Newcomb's work, 
I teach Pagans in the Promised Land, the book that you heard. I teach your new film. And I've learned so much from you about the epistemological and ontological origins of Western Christian domination in terms of a radical critique, meaning getting at the root, the underpinnings of what that Western domination looks like. When I'm talking about settler colonialism, a lot of you have a, have a, a point of reference for that. Just differentiating Hawaii as a colony. Hawaii was actually recognized as a colony by the United Nations from 1946 until 1959 as an unincorporated territory, sort of the cur current status of, say, Guam, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa. And the US intervened in the decolonization process by having a preemptive colonial administrative vote in 1959, where you had people, including US military personnel, being able to vote on a plebiscite of whether Hawaii should remain a colony or become the 50th state. And so the occupiers were allowed to actually vote in that plebiscite. But also note the year 1959. It's on the eve of the 1960 decolonization protocols where you would have had a different option on that ballot that would have necessarily included the option of independence. Now, um, what I want to just kind of draw out in terms of those critiques is thinking through, for me, the settler colonialism piece isn't just about whether you're a colony. And often, the analytic has been used uh, and theorized uh, from Haunani K. Trask in the Hawaii context, Patrick Wolfe's comparative work on Australia, Israel-Palestine in the United States, focusing on the southeastern removal. Uh, really thinking about the difference of what happens when settlers stay, right? So the idea is the differentiation between the franchise colony, say the English in India where they withdraw, versus the English in, say, North America. So that's the dis differentiation that that theory um, allows us, or that analytic. In terms of um, international law, one of the things that I'm working on, the forthcoming book that um, Dean mentioned in my bio, The Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty, I'm interested in that claim to independence that we're that we are in, we are able to make now as Hawaiian people because you can't you can't extinguish an independent nation's sovereignty just by occupying it or through unilateral annexation, right? As you heard, there is no treaty of annexation in Hawaii. You have an illegal overthrow in 1893 backed by the US military and the US has apologized for that and acknowledged that it was unlawful. And then you've got the 1898 unilateral annexation through a joint resolution of Congress. And then you've got a fraudulent 1959 you know, statehood plebiscite that at that time violates even the principles of self-determination that were already in place prior to 1960. None, you can't make any of that legal, right? And part of that has to do with the fact, like I said, that Hawaiian elites created this independent state in the 19th century. And some of you already know this, but a recap for those of you unfamiliar with Hawaiian history, you have High Chief Kamehameha forging bloody warfare uh, through you know, winning out kind of an arms race when you had Westerners uh, putting uh, arms in the hands of Hawaiians and forging unification of the islands from 1795 to 1810. And then when he passes, it's his son Kamehameha II, and then Kamehameha III, when he takes uh, when he's reigning, secures independent recognition the world over for the Hawaiian Kingdom, right? So our treaties with the US government, all five of them, none of them are treaties of cession. None of them give up any land or sovereignty. They're about postage stamps. They're about respecting each other's money orders. They're about favored nation status for trade and use rights of Pearl Harbor, not ceding Pearl Harbor. And you have uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom, as some of you know, had tr treaties of recognition, friendship, commerce, navigation, with all the major Western nations in the world at the time from 1843 on up, but starting with the US, Britain, and France. And so one of the things that I'm tracking is what the paradox is of that, because you have the kingdom being formed and securing that recognition by the 1840s globally only after the king bent to certain kinds of what we might call today in academe respectability politics, right? So this is after you have Hawaiian communal lands privatized. This is after the legal subordination of women through Christian marriage being the only legalized form of sex and um, Christian coverture, which is to subsume a woman's status beneath that of her husband's. 
and then also not just the criminalization, but the active penalization of sexual practices outside of a hetero dyadic Christian marriage in a society that was, you know, where bisexuality was, for all we know, normative and not just polyandry, but also polygamy. So people of all genders could have multiple partners and you didn't have marriage as we understand it in a Western Christian sense as sort of the lifelong contract. So I'm really interested in, in the way that Hawaiian elites instituted those laws. Those laws came about on the watch of Hawaiian sovereignty. It's Hawaiians that did that to their own, so to speak, but secured that independent sovereign status in a sense, I think, by distancing from what was seen at the time as primitive, savage, right, uncivilized, but in the name of protecting Hawaiian sovereignty from Western encroachment, hence the paradox. So we will make these changes to protect our sovereignty, and yet it's like an internal colonial job. And so I'm interested in how that's playing out in today's movement. And so my book project, Tax Between the Present and the, the Mid-19th Century, looking at land politics, gender politics, and sexual politics at the intersections between the federal recognition struggle and the kingdom restoration struggle. And where this gets me to our theme here around indigenous resurgence is really looking at what it means to think about indigenous resurgence in relation to land, gender, and sexuality. Um, those of you, um, and this isn't limited to academe, but those of you in the academy, you know, you, many of you will know the idea of talking about recuperating traditional life ways for indigenous communities. Any of you even, you know, remotely familiar with post-colonial theory will know that there's like an allergic reaction to even asserting that as a possibility, right? There's an assumption that people are trying to make a bid for some pure, you know, primordial past and, oh, you're just trying to recreate you know, Eden, it's like, actually, no, you know, <laughs> so again, <laughs> kind of keeps creeping back in. But, you know, this idea of radical recuperation, right? And so to me, it's not about um, vying for purity, it's about possibility, right? And the idea that you can have rupture, you can have Cooper Street, you can have Cooper Union, but we have Lenape people uh, not just alive, you know, but that, that element of survivance, as Gerald Visner would call it, the survival and resistance together, right? And so part of it, you know, settler colonialism and Patrick Wolfe's theory, one of the phrases that some of you may know is he talks about settler colonialism relying on the logic of the elimination of the native, that that, the, that, that is settler colonialism's operative logic, is to write the native out of existence, whether it's through all out um, killings, mass killings that are genocidal, whether it's about coercive bio-cultural assimilative projects, assimilation projects, or whether it's also about forced removal, right, eliminating the native from the land. And so for me, that idea of radical recuperation and indigenous resurgence, uh, for someone like me living on Wangunk territory, is to go up against that logic, to challenge that logic. Um, one of the ways that I've done that at Wesleyan University where I teach is, is, is a course called Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown and working with members, descendants of the, the last extended family that's known of Wayne Gunk who never left. And yet when you call Middletown City Hall, they'll tell you there are no Wayne Gunks. So the official doctrine, anytime there's a commemoration completely written out and you're thinking, no, actually we just had coffee. <laughs> You know, so that whole disappearance act, right? And trying to think about what it means to get students in the Middlesex County Historical Society doing archival research, looking at 1650s records, trying to look for Wayne Gunk, traces of Wayne Gunk in the archives. And they get frustrated. They're like, you know, they're in there, they're like, we're trying to find Indians and we're not finding them. It's like, that's what settler colonialism does, right? That's about it covering its tracks. It's about that erasure at the deepest level. And so that's one of the things that um, I'm trying to look at in terms of thinking through, you know, countering that kind of domination. And that's what, that's what sort of attracts me to anarchist queer sensibilities, is thinking through, you know, fending off domination in all its forms. So I just want to wrap up here by um, kind of bottom lining it. I mean, we have people in the kingdom movement, they've gone to such extremes by saying, 
We're not even indigenous. They don't even like that word anymore. They don't even like the term Native Hawaiian. They're like, that's a racial term. Yeah, I know, I wrote a book about it, actually. <laughs> you know, Native Hawaiian with the lowercase n connotes the 50% blood quantum rule. Native Hawaiian with an uppercase n. They're like, but that's American. Okay, you know, but they don't like indigenous. And I say, why not? They're like, it has to be aboriginal. Okay, you know, but I think it's deeper than nomenclature. I think what's happening here is sort of a pushing back on something that people, it's kind of like the return of the repressed. And on the one hand, you have all these celebratory projects that are incredibly rich, and yet when it comes to the governance pieces, and by governance, I don't mean the, I'm talking about the Western governance models in terms of federal recognition or independence, that piece of recognition, whether it's recognition from the rest of the world community in the 19th century, or whether it's recognition from the federal government, I think it's a trap. And for me, that's where decolonization or decoloniality comes in. And that's another one of those words. When you say decolonization within a context of post-colonialism, there's a lot of pushback. Somehow people seem a little friendlier to decoloniality. But the point is, is that you know, for me, decolonization, um, that's not just the historical decolonization of, say, the US. If the US had actually granted Hawaii independence in 1960 through an actual plebiscite, that would have been sort of historical decolonization in the legal sense. But decoloniality is so much deeper than that, right? And you can look at uh, indigenous theorist Silvia Rivera has written about this. Some of the mestizo uh, Latin American theorists have taken up these concepts of coloniality and decoloniality. But to really talk about it, not just in everyday practices, but also in the epistemological core to think about, you know, so even, this is where I would say to kingdom nationalists, even if they say we, we should have never been on the list of non-self-governing territories, the US held us as a colony illegally. I'm like, I understand the illegality. I'm talking about power, right? And even if that didn't happen, because there's sort of an exceptionalist narrative of Hawaiian sovereignty, you know, we're this wild hybrid model. We, we're an co actual colony, we're a kingdom, we have the indigenous question, we're the 50th state. You know, and I'm not trying to advance an exceptionalism. I'm just talking about sort of all the different kind of legal modalities that one jockeys, uh, for me, tactically, not as the solution, but you know, any kind of leverage to point out that the US has no actual claim on Hawaii. That doesn't mean that they're pulling out of Pearl Harbor tomorrow, right? So um, for me, that question is thinking through the projects that go beyond those modes, because for kingdom nationalists, and, and this is just a particular segment of the movement, I don't want to gloss this as the whole independence movement, I want to take care in saying that this is a slice, but it's a very vocal slice, that it's not for me about denouncing indigeneity. Indigenous status is not, indigeneity is not the dirty word, indigenous peoples are not the problem. Again, it's Western state domination at the global level. Because people say, well, you, you can't go down the indigenous track because then there's, there's no there there, there's no power there. And it's like, but that doesn't mean that that's because of indigeneity. That has to do with the kind of mechanics, the structural violence of states that actually subordinate indigenous peoples. And so for me, you know, if there's not an indigenous specific piece to that, to that movement, then what's the point, right? And for me, there's just no way I will go down the federal recognition track willingly because I'm not about forfeiting the claim. Just because it, the independence claim cannot be realized at this particular moment doesn't mean we forfeit it. To me, you protect the claim and you push the boundaries in other ways. And for me, pushing the boundaries in other ways has to do with indigenous resurgence. And Hawaiians are so active in that. And that includes some Hawaiians on the kingdom nationalist and as well as Hawaiians who support federal recognition. So I'm not trying to draw a binary when it comes to those projects. But what those look like, in addition to this amazing uh, voyaging technology that Na'alehu presented to us, include the, the work of the Loi restoration, right? So taro cultivation and restoring taro beds, um, trying to re, uh, retrack waterways to be able to feed those lands. You have the Ahupua'a and watershed development. My auntie Puanani Rogers on the island of Kauai has been very active in sort of trying to renew the idea of the ahupua'a, the traditional land divisions, and having people have autonomy within those spheres and really going local in terms of that. And also everything from traditional massage, you know, lapa'au, traditional tattooing, 
hula mele, makahiki, other spiritual ceremonies. These are just some of the examples. For me, it's about trying to renew our models. Hawaiian society was very hierarchical. There's no debating that. That's true. But that doesn't mean that we don't have models for non-proprietary relationships. And for me, that's why I'm looking at land, gender, and sexuality. I'm interested in the ways that people related to the land and relate to the land today and non um, outside of property regimes and in terms of gender relationships, in terms of sexuality and, and sexual relationships, to think outside of ownership models. So for me, that decoloniality has to include the non-proprietary piece, and that's what kind of draws me to those three prongs. And on that note, I'll just um, end by um, thinking through the word hoku lea, right? So hoku is star, and lea in that context, as I understand it, or was taught, is about the zenith star, right? But lea itself as a word also means pleasure or joy. And so for me, that's what I would like to end on in thinking about decolonization in terms of pleasure, bodily pleasure, interpersonal pleasure, the pleasure of the collective, and thinking through that in terms of a decolonial model that is not about ownership. Mahalo nui loa. Gishi le mi, mi ongun na walkan, mi li ongun na walkan, wali Nepali, wali Nepalinan, wanishi gishi le mi. Delawensi Steve Newcomb, nu le lendam elipan, le nape hoking. I said a short prayer in our Lenape language, and. Uh, my name is Steve Newcomb, and it's good for you to come here today in uh, Lenape Hopi, Lenape Nation Territory. Um, I want to uh, pay my respects to our Lenape, Monsi, and Delaware ancestors and uh, to acknowledge that this is our territory and that we have thousands of years of existence and relationship to point to, uh, that our traditional territory extends from this region down into New Jersey, what's now called New Jersey, Delaware, Eastern Pennsylvania, and that uh, thousands and thousands of years of existence spiritually and culturally with a particular place on Mother Earth does not cease to exist simply because of uh, the kind of history that we've experienced. David Stannard, in his amazing book, American Holocaust, looks at some of the demographics of the hemisphere, and he points out that uh, some of those demographics indicate that uh, as many as 100 million people existed throughout the hemisphere uh, prior to the colonization and that somewhere in the area of 95% of all the people perished. So you take uh, our population as Lenape people, uh, the 1890 census, uh, we, there was uh, 850 of us counted, as I recall, and, uh, and our Shawnee people, 650 people remaining. The Kumeyaay people with whom I work, the Kumeyaay Nation, uh, there was about 950, less than 1,000 in any case, in the 1890 census, and it goes on like that. So if you think of, of those numbers, 75, over the period of 75 years in central Mexico, somewhere in the area of 25 million people perished. Now that's a lot of contributing factors. Uh, a lot of people like to point to simply disease, but it, it was a combination of of factors, and some people call it a seesaw effect. So it's the, the disease, then the, the um, massacres, the warfare, the forced uh, enslavement of, of native people, and so forth. Um, so when you consider that, and you think about the amount of knowledge, the accumul accumulated knowledge and wisdom over thousands and thousands of years being blotted out in such a rapid manner, and then what we were left with in terms of the uh, after effects and the trauma 
from the domination and dehumanization system that came in on top of us, then you begin to understand what we've been attempting to do, and by we, I mean original nations and peoples collectively throughout the world, attempting to come to terms with that and get a sense of ourselves and come back into our understanding of our traditional ways and our traditional knowledge and wisdom systems. I wanted to take this opportunity to pay my respects to Kekuni Blaisdell, such a wonderful heroic man who recently passed in Hawaii and uh, was a key part of the Hawaiian independence movement for quite a you know, generation. <laughs> actually quite elderly when he passed. And my friend Nalani Minton, my dear friend, uh, with whom uh, I worked over the years. And, um, and I wanted to say that this effort to revitalize, to create a resurgence with our language, cultures, and spiritual traditions is what really is uh, a unifying factor for all of our original nations and peoples. And in thinking about the Hokulea and what happened on March 8th of uh, seven, 1975 when the first launch took place and what a momentous occasion that was and everything that has transpired since then and the um, arrival of the Hokulea to the Pacific Northwest into the Seattle area in 1995 and uh, my friend William Pila Lornal William Lornell, Pila's uh, nickname is Pila, dear friend of mine. Uh, he was instrumental in working to coordinate that, that uh, with the Pacific nations, the nations in the Pacific Northwest, to get everything ready and to prepare. And it was tremendous effort on the part of all those uh, folks. And that was such an inspiration when, they, when the Hokulea and the uh, Hawaii, Aloha, Hawaii Aloha arrived, the two voyaging uh, vessels, the two, two voyaging canoes, arrived, and it inspired the uh, nations of the Pacific Northwest, the Coast Salish people and, and others, the Lummi Nation and Nisqually and Frank's Landing, and all the people that had been so supportive of, of uh, the, those vessels arriving, that then that began a paddling tradition on their part. Now they have, you know, each year they have an amazing uh, voyaging tradition with the traditional canoes. Now that's on the ocean, but you also have my friend and mentor, Virgil Kilstrait, a traditional headman of the Oglala Lakota Nation, and Alex Whiteplume, and a number of others, who began the uh, memorial rides in honor of Chief Bigfoot and the Hunk Papa that were slaughtered and massacred at Wounded Knee in 1890. And they began a commemorative horseback ride in the winter under extremely difficult conditions. The last year that they rode in those first four years, it was 80 below zero wind chill factor. And it's just un unbelievable uh, conditions, very challenging for them. But it was all done in a ceremonial manner. And then the next two years as well. Um, so the point I'm getting at is that this was all connecting energy and it was all done ceremonially. The same as with the, the, the voyaging canoes. It's connecting nations, it's connecting energy lines. It's the one year that Virgil and and uh, a lot of other folks did a horseback ride across Canada. They did it in a particular manner, and the shape, if you drew it out on a map, would draw the shape of a sacred pipe. But there was a mistake that was made, and they had to double back at a certain point, and uh, kind of lost their way a little bit, and then they re rerouted. Well, when they drew that out, it turned out to be the shape of a woman's pipe and it just happened to occur, right? So these are the magical ways in which uh, our nations and peoples come together and the way in which serendipitous uh, occurrences take place, the guidance of ancestors that are with us and uh, continuously. And it's our effort to, I, I liken it to being in a coma and you come out of the coma and say, oh man, you, you wrapped your car around that tree, you know, and uh, you barely made it, but you know, and so then you're, you're reeling from that, you're slowly coming back into, into consciousness. And I think that's, there's such a tremendous shock that has happened to our nations and peoples. Now, why is that? 
the two main terms that I use in my analysis at this point are domination and dehumanization. No matter where you look throughout the history of our nations and peoples and the way in which Christendom came in on top of us, that's what you're going to see. Now there's all kinds of terminology for that, but, but it boils down to those, those two terms. So the mention earlier of, uh, of you'd have no voice or they'd try to take away your voice, that's dehumanization. That's removing, that's the effort to remove your existence by removing your ability to have a voice, to express yourself on your own terms. Part of the domination begins with ceremonies of domination. So particularly here, because we are right here at ground zero, so to speak, with the Dutch and, and the Swedes and so forth, um, you have these ceremonies of possession, as they call them in the literature, that were part of the conquest. Scholars love this phrase, the conquest, because it sounds like it's something that's over and done with and it happened long ago. But I reframe that and I say it's the domination and it's an ongoing process. And so these are ceremonies where they, through some kind of superstitious nonsense, come ashore and conduct some kind of a, a ritual, ritualistic act with a notary public there and maybe they wave a sword in the air or they pile some stones or they break a branch or they tear up some grass or uh, hold some dirt in their hand is what's called a metonymy, the part that stands for the whole. And so this part, this soil that they hold in their hand, they're taking possession of everything. And uh, 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 Balboa is an excellent example. In Kumeyaay territory, now there's an effort to erect a, a statue to the conquistador Balboa. Um, Vasquez, no, Vasquez his, uh, what is it, Nunez, or Vasco Nunez Balboa, right? Anyway, uh, rapacious uh, person that he was with his dogs and so forth, um, just as all those guys were uh, maniacal sorts of characters. But anyway, they want to erect the statue to Balboa. And why is that? Why did they name it Balboa Park? Well, there was the Panamanian Exposition in what's now called Balboa Park, uh, and Balboa, of course, was the guy who made it across the isthmus in what's uh, now Panama, across the isthmus to view the Pacific Ocean, and he was the first human being to ever see the Pacific Ocean. It's quite amazing, you know. <laughs> um, and so on that basis, they put him in this lofty uh, pinnacle, and, and uh, and what's really interesting, you have the voyaging tradition uh, with the Hokulea, for example, but those guys are still trying to reinscribe, reinforce their colonial narratives. They're celebrating colonization. They just built, the San Diego Maritime Museum just built a replica of the San Salvador, the Holy Savior, sailed by uh, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. In 1542, he made it to the Kumeyaay territory and went up the coast and ended up dead. Um, the Spanish Navy, and in fact, the Spanish Crown has um, done some interesting things in terms of recognizing the Maritime Museum. They're giving knighthood to the president of that uh, museum. They've given a very high award to a pr professor at the University of San Diego. Iris Engstrom for special services to the history of Spain, uh, that sort of thing. And um, there's no effort on their part to acknowledge the truth of history. They don't want anything to do with truth telling in history. They want the, their fairy tale version, the sanitized version. And the thing is that when you go to the statue of Cabrillo, which is at the Cabrillo National Monument, at Point Loma, and you look at the base of that statue, you'll see a plaque that was put there by the Spanish Navy, not the United States Navy, the, Sp the Navy of Spain in the early 200s, I forget, 2004, whenever it was. And it talks about the ceremony of possession that Cabrillo conducted. Well, 
I work in an archives on one of the Kumeyaay reservations, and uh, we have access to all kinds of fabulous documents. And one of them is the notes from the voyage of Cabrillo. Now, the original log is lost, but there are the notes. And you go through those notes, and there's no evidence, indication, not that I would accept it even if it happened, but there's no indication that Cabrillo ever conducted one of those ceremonies in that area. Further south, yes, in Ensenada, in that region, up in San Pedro, but never in that area. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to write to the Spanish Navy and ask them to cough up the uh, historical documentation on that plaque. But again, it doesn't mean that I accept the truth of, of, of that pretense on their part. Now, um, I don't want to go too long here. I know we're pressed for time and we want some questions and answers, but I wanted to give you a bit more insight into the nature of the domination system and how it's embedded in the language. The domination system is a language. And for example, the word civilization, most of us, I think all of us were, that went to public schools and so forth, um, or even Catholic schools, whatever kind of schooling you got, I bet that you were taught that civilization is a really positive thing. And uh, that's why we were considered uncivilized because we weren't, we weren't up to that level. And when you look up the word civilization in the Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, it has the following definition. The forcing of a particular cultural pattern on a population to which it is foreign. So this foreign cultural pattern comes in and is forced on a people and that's civilization. That's one of the key definitions. Property, as defined by Lance Liebman and, and um, Charles Monroe uh, Haar, um, Mr. Liebman is a um, professor at Columbia University, in their property law textbook, it defines property as the first establishment of socially approved physical domination over some part of the natural world. And I wrote to Professor Liebman, and he was kind enough to respond to explain the basis of that sentence in, their, in the opening of their book. And it goes back to William Blackstone, who defined property as despotic dominion. Uh, the word sovereignty, there's a one, wonderful book by Jonathan Havercroft in which he explains that the, some of the major political philosophers such as Hannah Arendt, uh, Michel Foucault, uh, Hart, uh, Gambon, Negri, and so forth, that they understand by that term to mean a unjust form of domination. Not to suggest that there's a, a just form of domination, but anyway, I think he put that unjust on there to emphasize the, the unjust nature of domination. And so we're talking about uh, one nation or people assuming or asserting the right to force another nation or people to live in subjection to its will or to their will. And that's the nature of the U.S. federal Indian law system. And Chief Justice John Marshall in the very famous uh, case Johnson versus McIntosh from 1823 used all kinds of the coding of domination to write that decision. And he said of the monarchs, they assumed the ultimate dominion, that word goes back to the Latin dominium, and it uh, goes back to the idea of political power grown from property was in effect domination as revealed by William Brandon in one of his books. But he said they assumed the ultimate dominion to be in themselves and uh, assumed and exercised the uh, power to grant the soil while in possession of the, na of the natives. So this idea that the native people, the native, uh, as to use their terminology, uh, in the decision, it talks about the natives who were heathens. And the, the, the distinction there in the charters and the Vatican documents of the 15th century are looking at a distinction between Christians and non-Christians, the idea that the Christians are going to go forth throughout the world in search of non-Christian lands, not non-European lands, non-Christian lands. It's very important to maintain that distinction so that we don't do damage to history because it was out of a religious framework that they were operating. And it went back to these Vatican documents from the 15th century, which are the documents that the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling is based upon as real, revealed by Joseph Story in his book, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States. Story was on the court at the time of the Johnson ruling, 
He was a person who best friends with John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he didn't have to be so careful in his commentaries, and they were a little bit more nuanced in the, in the decision itself, so he actually footnotes to the Papal Bull of 1493, one of them, and, and gives this understanding. And he says, story says, in explanation of Johnson versus McIntosh, he says that um, as, meaning because they were, as infidels, heathens, and savages, they were not allowed to possess the prerogatives belonging to absolute sovereign and independent nations. So on the basis of something that, that uh, is called terra nullus, or nullus, not nullius, N-U-L-L-I-U-S is one form, nullus is N-U-L-L-U-S, which is a different form. And that means a uh, heathen, infidel, or unbaptized person. So if you're not baptized, you're considered to not exist, and you're certainly not human. And so what that does is it gives them the opportunity to show up to a non-Christian land, perform those ceremonies of possession, as they call it, and then the standards, the royal standards that they put in the soil, the flags, are a double entendre, that word is a double entendre for the standards of judgment that will then be imposed and applied in a, what's called the civilizing mission, the mission of Im imposing or forcing that foreign cultural pattern on a population to which, well, yeah, you get the idea. So there are these key terms of domination and dehumanization that have been woven into something that's called US federal Indian law and policy. And to wrap up, God, there's so much more I was gonna say. Um, but, but to wrap up, I wanted to explain that in 1954, the uh, US Justice Department issued a legal brief to the Supreme Court in a case called Tihitan Indians versus the United States. And the main argument of the Justice Department was that the Tihitan Indian people did not deserve monetary compensation for a taking of their timber and their land because, the, this is a direct quote, the Christian nations of Europe had discovered the lands of heathens and infidels. Now, do you ever hear that? mention anywhere. The same year that Brown versus Board of Education was handed down overturning the Jim Crow laws, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court was was handing down, a dis well the Justice Department was issuing this to the S Supreme Court and the following year Stanley Reed wrote the decision for the court and he cited, you'll look in that decision and not find any mention of Christianity, but what you will see as a code is his citation of Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law, written in 1836. Wheaton was the reporter for the Supreme Court in the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling. In his book, he lays out under the chapter on property, remember what the definition of property is, right? He lays out the whole framework going back to the papal bulls of the 15th century, and this sentence is very pivotal, the heathen nations of the other quarters of the globe were the lawful spoil and prey of their civilized conquerors. That's the existing law to this day, right now, as we sit here, and you sit here, I stand here. So, the th some of you standing in the back, but in any case, um, the, the, the thing that I wanted to get to is the fact that what really unites all of us is water, and that's really what this is about with the voyaging, right? Because when I went to Palenque, in in, in um, an amazing part of Mexico, I found out that the Mayan word for water is ha, and the Kumeyaay word for water is ha, and the Kumeyaay word for the creator is my ha, which is the waters above. I think a lot of people are used to an abstraction of God. God is an abstraction, right? But I got to thinking about it. Without the waters above falling to earth in the, in the rain cycle, and that without that rain cycle, there is no life. And then aloha is the ha is spirit in the, in the Kanaka Maoli language. So the thing is that the water unifies all of us. It really does. But the problem is that the domination and dehumanization system is destroying the waters of the planet. That's what unifies us all, is that caution that we have to have because of Fukushima.
because of Hanford Nuclear Facility, because of Indian Point Nuclear Facility, all these places where the radiation is going into the groundwater, going into the, the rain cycle, going into the life cycle, you've got the Bikini Atoll, the horrific number of detonations of, that the United States committed against the world, and France, and all these, these great powers of the world that are also the greatest arms merchants on the planet, whose systems are predicated on domination and dehumanization at the very core and at the very root. And that is the thing that we all face. And we need to come together and have an understanding of what is embedded in, the, in this English language that I'm communicating uh, with, you know, on the basis of which I'm communicating with you. And we need to figure out what we're going to do about that. If you go to Canada and they talk about the murdered and missing women, what are we talking about? The domination and dehumanization and destruction of women. But it, it's not talked about in terms of domination. Bullying in schools, you know, that's, that's a current thing, right? But they don't teach it in terms of domination. If you were to take a notebook and record on a daily basis all those places that you see evidence of domination and dehumanization occurring, whether it's in your everyday life, on the internet, on the news, wherever it happens to be, you'd have that notebook filled up in no time. Now how is it that, that's, that given that that's the case, I don't know of any university on the planet that has a Department of Domination Studies. Now it could be true, I mean there might be one, but I just don't know of it. There's genocide studies at Yale, uh, ben Kiernan, so that's that's getting there. But I'm I'm keying in on this idea that metaphors shape and create the reality that's that we experience, and we need to have the right kind of metaphors to identify the the nature of the problem that we're dealing with. Finally, the indigenous knowledge and wisdom systems, our languages, people like Virgil Killstreet and Francois Paulette and so many others, these amazing people that have managed to maintain these, these systems of understanding. You know, Virgil talks about the seven laws of the Ochete Shikoan, you know, that sharing and caring and uh, to share and to care and to give, to honor and respect, compassion and pity, patience and fortitude, bravery and courage seeking wisdom, seeking understanding, humbleness and humility. They form together a totality of behavior and insight, a way, a code of conduct that is supposed to have respect for all forms of life. And when you go to every original nation and people, and you notice I'm not using the term indigenous this evening, because in the UN definition of that term, it means dominated peoples. And I wanna, I wanna move out of that and acknowledge that we are the original, not aboriginal. I used that term up north above the US Canadian line and in Manitoba and some of the elders were like, like, whoa, what's up with that word? I thought they used that up here. And then I got to thinking about it, abnormal, <laughs> uh, right? So aboriginal is the context for it is, is the colonization system. I wanna thank you very much for your patience and uh, this evening, and I thought uh, I, I certainly um, it's my desire that you gain something from my talk this evening and from all of our presentations. Our movie, The Doctrine of Discovery Unmasking the Domination Code, is available at 38plus2productions.com through the director Sheldon Wolfchild. And uh, one Ishii, thank you. We have time for Q&A, but before we go to Q&A, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Kaina Kegna for making all of these beautiful Hilo Lei. Hi, I was hoping um, you could speak a little bit more about the relationship between Hawaii and Micronesia, being that uh, the original navigator was from Micronesia and there's great deal of questioning around uh, Micronesian and Marshallese immigrants in Hawaii right now. He's like, oh, not my panel. You answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, the, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, I can speak from, from uh, the perspective of using the film to kind of bridge some of those gaps. Um, I don't think a lot of people know about the, the, 
where the knowledge necessarily came from when it was seeded back into uh, Hawaii by by Mao Pialo, and um, when we showed the we screened the film at all kind of places. I mean, venues like this and festivals, but we went into like homeless shelters and and these places out on the west side where there's um, a, a lot of a lot of Hawaiians and a lot of Micronesians, and they're all bundled together and exploring that relationship about how they got along um, and the the wealth of knowledge that Mao provided Hawaiians uh, started to shift that conversation a little bit. Um, I know Ma was kind of frowned upon when he took and started teaching navigation outside of Micronesia. And that was something that came to bear when we went back in 2007 when he provided the post ceremony for both uh, five Hawaiians and 11 Micronesians. Um, but what became clear was that he expected everyone to get along because of the teaching and that, that they were now all, we were all um, uh, one and that that because of the canoes were bound to help each other. So, hope that helps. Uh, what has been the effect of having a Hawaiian president on Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Hawaiian president? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to just quickly respond to that, um, not directly to that, but to something that was said earlier about the annexation of Hawaii that never took place never happened and people need to know that I, in 1999 I was working with my friend Glenn Morrison with Nalani Minton and I had the opportunity to go through the congressional record and look very carefully at how that was debated and because of the Kui petitions and the effort, lobbying efforts of the Kanaka Maoli people that went to Washington and met with senators, they defeated that bill. I mean, excuse me, they defeated the treaty. And um, they, they knew that they couldn't get the two-thirds majority that they needed to pass the treaty. So they took the content of the treaty and they put it into the form of a joint resolution, which only needed a majority vote. But there were members of Congress that pointed out that according to the terms of the Constitution, the only way that you could have an annexation is if it was annexed as a, ter as a state, not as a territory. And one of the congressmen from California made a very specific point. He said, the gentlemen are attempting to do that which cannot be constitutionally done. It never happened. So I wrote a, an article on that in the year 2000 that was published by one of the newspapers in, in Hawaii that the title of it was Justice Department Memo Shows U.S. Never Legally Annexed Hawaii. And uh, so I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Stephen got, that, Stephen got that article in the Honolulu Advertiser and I was at a protest in 2008 and a friend gave me that article. So it's still circulating eight years later and just recently, Pono Ke Aloha, who is this kind of guerrilla social media activist, reposted it again on Facebook. So it's still, in fact, circulating. I would just point out, in terms of um, that history, I mean, I also want to, I'm so glad you mentioned Kekuni Blaisdell, who just passed recently. And he and Nalani Minton, his niece, convened the Hawaii People's Tribunal in 1993. And part of that was to get sort of the world opinion on the case against the United States for these illegal acts. And so just want to acknowledge him. He's one of the people that I think, um, from my understanding and from knowing him for 26 years, he revived the concept of ea, which becomes a gloss for Hawaiian sovereignty, which means life, right? So it's not that uh, state-centric uh, Western or Westphalian notion of sovereignty, although we use the S word to leverage certain claims. Um, 
it's, and that can be problematic. In terms of Obama, I mean, I guess I would challenge calling him Hawaiian. Well, I mean, Hawaiian. I would say Hawaii born because Hawaiian has always, always connoted uh, indigeneity. And also, and even today, people that challenge that, it means that people are subject of the Hawaiian kingdom regardless of ancestry. So I don't think Hawaiian has an, and it's not analogous to Californian just because of that history. So I would say Hawaii born, just to be specific, and that has to do with blood quantum politics and the subordination of Hawaiian people who have always been glossed as Hawaiian. But also, you know, Obama went to Punahou, as many of you know, and Punahou was started by the uh, missionaries who came from Connecticut and Massachusetts largely, and they started that school for their children because they didn't want their children to be socialized with Hawaiian kids because they thought Hawaiian kids were too sexual. So to me, it kind of is all connected in that way. I mean, we talk about him, he talks about himself as growing up sort of poor with white grandparents in Hawaii, but he came out of one of the most elite institutions claimed within the boundaries of the US, the USA. So, you know, for me, if you look at his presidential, when he ran the first time around, he gave a talk before the National Congress of American Indians and vowed on camera, if you Google it, YouTube it, he vowed that if he was elected, he would honor every US treaty with tribes. He also said he would close Guantanamo. <laughs> He's also deported more people than any other president. How's it been? Horrendous. But this is the US, this is US empire. Um, I happen to like Obama, and I, I also went to Punahou. So um, <laughs> he's a little younger than me, so I didn't meet him. But when you say Hawaiian, I'm not ethnically Hawaiian, but I am in spirit. And in, in, I, I'm from Hawaii. So I, I guess I kind of take objection to saying I'm not the one. You know, does, does, does that have an impact that I feel Hawaiian on everything you're saying? It kind of bothers me. Because you can be, you can be whatever you want in heart and spirit and association, and, you know, so. I thought I would just say that. Well, I can't contest how you feel. I just, I grew up in Southern California on Gabrieleno lands, but it doesn't make me a Gabrieleno Indian, no matter how much I feel uh, connected to parts of Orange County, for example. And I respect the ocean. I grew up on that side of the Pacific. I even spent a few years on Balboa Island. <laughs> so, so the whole Balboa. you call yourself Hawaiian? If you can just let me finish. Um, to me, that would just still, it would be appropriative. I mean, my family lives on Hawaiian homelands and they have to prove their genealogy in 30 page documents to substantiate their claims, blood claims to the state. So to me, um, there's issues of privilege in those choices. And also, it's fine if you like Obama. I mean, that's individual agency. I'm talking about structures of oppression. That is, the US is a global dominator of the world. And that's why to me, when people say, who do you like for president? It, there is the office of president, you know, there is the office. And so to me, you know, we can talk about in individualist terms and we can talk about agency, but to me it always has to be talked about in relation to structures. And in this case, we're talking about structures of domination. Hawaii, Hawaiian has historically always meant indigenous Polynesians in Hawaii. And so to me, to conflate it is to make my family invisible. You know, I, I always ask a question with regard to that kind of terminology. Uh, in what context? It's so important to identify in what context we're using any particular term. And, um, and once we do that, then we begin to clarify things that might be obscured otherwise. So in what context did, what, did, the, did the question get raised to begin with, you know? In what context do you feel yourself to be identified ho in, uh, to Hawaii in that way, and so forth. Um, so that perhaps that would be helpful. Just to lighten things up, can you tell us something about <laughs> <laughs> that, and, and you said this is a fiberglass construction. We can talk to the original, the original journey of the original people. Yeah, so the, Hokulea was built in 
um, 75, 74 and 75. And uh, again, it's a, it's a best guess at what you would have seen 600 years ago. And the reason why I say best guess is because you have all of these data points that you can lean upon to make that guess. Uh, you have um, everything from petroglyphs to the original uh, drawings from the ship artist who was on these first passages into um, the Central and, and North Pacific. And <clears throat> what you have is you have all of this, uh, all of these attributes that canoes have. Uh, and by the way, when when um, when Captain Cook first got to Hawaii, if you if you read the logs. They got to Kealakekua, thousands of canoes came out. There were smaller canoes. And, and just for, for the sake of argument, uh, they had stopped voyaging sometime well before that. So um, we're not really sure why, but there were these canoes that, were, that still existed in the Pacific um, you know, up until a couple hundred years ago, and then they slowly died out for, for other forms of transportation. These larger canoes you didn't really see but when Herb Kane did the drawings for Hokulea, he took these attributes that were most common, uh, that were some of the oldest, and built what you would call a performance accurate replica. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think everybody spoke to these missing pieces of, of culture as we, as we went along, as we saw depopulation and, and things like that. And certainly there are missing pieces of technology and missing pieces of uh, the resilience of our um, island way of life. So b by the 90s, you couldn't find logs big enough to build a canoe that large anymore, right? So the story of Hawaii Loa and that connection to uh, the Alaska natives is because we had to go ask for logs from their countries because w we didn't have it anymore. And so the degradation not only happens to us, but it happens to the land as well. Now. What this canoe taught us was a tremendous amount, and that's why they've built canoes on, on that uh, over time. So um, Hokulea, the, the canoe that's coming here June 5th, is the original uh, set of hulls that they built in the 70s, so that she's still floating. She's gone through many, many transformations, but same, same hulls. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a New York Harbor student, my name's Kamiko, and I read that Hokulea um, navigators need to stay awake for about 22 hours per day for up to 30 days. And the navigator takes short, short naps for about 15 to 20 minutes throughout the day. And I wanted to know how is that possible? <laughs> so everybody heard the question that the navigators typically stay awake for 22 hours a day and they only take small uh, cat naps. Um, I've, I've seen them do it. I've seen uh, Nainoa and Bruce and Kalapa stay up for almost days on end with these very, very short naps in between uh, when we're at sea. And I think it's, um, it's, probably, it's probably three parts. Uh, the, the first part um, is uh, one of training. And so they train for that. The second part is um, one of needing to know every bit of information that you have captured along the way to know where you are. So there's an equation, distance equals rate times time. So you have to know all of those distances and all of those speeds to know uh, where you are along your course. Um, and then the third, I think, is, is, a, is an innate one. As a leader on the canoe, uh, you feel the burden of the other souls that are on board and the responsibility to them, and that, that keeps you up as well. You know, uh, Nalani related a story to me in 1999, I believe it was, where the, they had to turn at a certain point, and it was overcast, so they had no real sense of what was going on based on what they could see with the sky. And, and they were getting a little concerned because if they didn't make this important turn, then it could be really problematic. Suddenly, at just the right moment, the clouds parted just slightly, and the, and the stargazer was able to catch just enough of a glimpse of the sky to be able to see exactly what they needed to do. So in his, in his mind, he had to put all the rest of that together just based on that one little snapshot, so to speak. I, that blew my mind to, to think of how sophisticated that understanding is and the skill that must be involved in that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I read that book by Sam Lowell, you know, and uh, he talked about Mal was able, when Nainoa was, uh, was navigating and he was teaching him, he was below the hull, and he could know by the sound of the waves hitting the side of the hull where they were and, and you know, if Nainoa was actually, you know, navigating correctly. And that, me away. Is that a, you guys understand that? Okay, so first and foremost, I'm not a navigator. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so secondly, yeah, the, the idea of um, non instrument navigation involves depth of knowledge on all these levels of sensory understanding to be able to. Um, basically take notice of the smallest change in anything. It can be weather, it can be stars, it can be um, swell, it can be wind, and all of those, uh, all of those ability to read mm -hmm. gives you uh, the ability to find direction and course. And one of the big things that they teach is, uh, is, is swell. And so the way the swell uh, hits the canoe and the direction of that swell is actually on, if it's a big ocean going swell, it will give you direction for many days. And so um, what he could feel, there's, there's a bunch of stories about that. He could feel them change course in the middle of the night because of the way the canoe rocked. And that's absolutely true, especially for someone at the depth of knowledge because um, the, the ability of sight is actually just like one small fraction. So when they say like stargazing, you know, it's just, it's like one small piece because guess what? Half your day, there's no stars. There's only one is the sun. And when there's 100% cloud cover, what do you do? And so there are all of these other tools that you use. Um, the next would be swell, and then after that, wind, depending on the, uh, which navigator it is. Is there any indication that there was an attempt to do uh, replicate uh, Cochlea prior to 75? Uh, is there any indication that there was an attempt to replicate something like Cochlea prior to 1975? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, there are systems of navigation that were still working uh, in the kind of the outer Pacific and Micronesia, it's still going on today. Um, but within Polynesia proper, um, you probably wouldn't have seen that. I mean, if you look back, right, there's there's all these other things that they were dealing with, right? Like you know, genocide and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have seen it in the, in the 200 years of kind of written history. And before that, there are these stories, but a lot of those people perished before they were written down. Mm -hmm. Vince, do you know any additional? Only that, that Phoenix uh, prototype. Not like here. Not like here. Yeah. It wasn't a deep sea canoe, though. It was more like a. Yeah. So let's take two more questions. My question is what, um, what is the relationship between Native Hawaiian insurgents like the Omea and the tourism industry? Uh, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how you mean, but I'll take a swing. I mean, um, I think that the nature of the tourist is changing. The nature of the visitor is changing. In that, visitors are. I think. I think they want something different now. Uh, you can certainly find nice beaches and nicer beaches than Hawaii, and palm trees and tea leaf and and little bits of culture that's far more established in other places than Hawaii. I think part of Vince talked about it. Part of Hawaii is that nostalgia of the generations before that came, and, and that is still, there's still the entrails of that. Um, I think that there's a pretty big movement afoot to utilize tourism or the visitor industry in a way that is respectful to culture, or more respectful to culture than it has been, and that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity to teach, this is an opportunity to change the mindset, that's an opportunity uh, to make sure that uh, culture can be practiced in all kind of places. It's not perfect, um, but I, I think there is a movement in that direction. I would just add a, sort of a different edge to that, which is the co-optation piece. And this, to me, speaks to, it intersects with Vince's points earlier at the first panel, Vince Diaz, who's sitting over here. In terms of the state co-optation, of our indigenous ways and practices precisely when they're the most powerful. And so I think about 
tracking um, tourist pamphlets. Before everything went online, there used to be these glossy, almost magazine-like tourist booklets. You know, they still make them for some countries, but not in a way that you just could get them. You could go to any travel agency and just get like 30 books, glossy books on Hawaii. And I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, if you looked at Hawaii, there was a very slim, looked European, Asian, mixed woman in hula, uh, hula skirt for years, and then it sort of evolved into children, mixed, perhaps Polynesian white mixed, very light-skinned children in the tourist books. And then by, you know, the time you get to the mid-90s, the magazines had, you know, large brown women with tea leaf skirts. And so I, I just saw that as just, you know, co-opting and commercializing the indigenous resurgence prog process in Hawaii, which is, you know, the return to kahikuhula, the revival of Hawaiian language, you know, embracing uh, our people in all their spectrum, spectrum in terms of, of the visual um, representations. And so I think you're right in terms of it having, opening up spaces of possibility. It's not just one thing. It's not just like a steamroller. But that idea of the state supporting these efforts and interfacing with corporate entities that's, that are tied to transnational capital to try and usurp that power. And that's, that's capitalizing on Hawaiian mana and Hawaiian resurgence that comes out of decolonization. I mean, when you think of the state laws against teaching, teaching any topic using Hawaiian language as a mode, as a, as a language of instruction, a medium of instruction, those laws weren't taken down until the 1980s. And those come right out of the, the Republic of Hawaii after the overthrow, before US you know, annexation by joint resolution. And when the US took over Hawaii, they didn't take those laws off the books. You had Hawaiian as the official language of the state in 1978, but you could learn Hawaiian language as a foreign language in Hawaii. You couldn't teach, as, teach it as a medium of instruction. And so the idea that the state now is like, dance and learn your language. You know, when the state, again, if the state is initiating it, you know, just run for cover. <laughs> something, something's bad, but that's not to say you have these intersections where people can actually do different kinds of, they can, they can carve out those spaces. And that, again, is the agency in relation to the structure. I, I think it's worth uh, thinking about uh, actually a very robust genealogy that precedes and makes uh, the, the revival possible in the whole history of watermen. So the world of the surf and Hawaiian surfers, right? It, it's striking that that the leadership, the initial leadership that finds uh, founds the College of Hawaiian Society, that that really um, um, it's it, it, I know of Thompson and Ruth Black and you know, those guys that that have a long history of um, of being in the water. Mm -hmm. and they may not have known anything about about mm -hmm. voyaging, but they were it, it means something that they were at home in the water. They were fishermen. They were they were surfers, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and that that has a very complex and tense relationship with tourism. But it's also a place where where tourism <coughs> offers a little bit of opportunity for them to to also uh, eke something out. Mm -hmm. right? But what happens is that that that. The Voyaging Society in Okalea um, caps that. It caps that, and that's, that's where it, they take it from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much for being with all of us today. Please, thank you. Our generous speakers.